Welcome back to the studio. You're watching Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Shona Bhattacharya. Let's take a look at our top stories in this edition. Holding their breath, the people of Gabon wait as the Constitutional Court decides whether or not to grant opposition leader Jean Ping's request to recount a portion of the ballots in last month's presidential election. 17 billion U.S. dollars worth of Nigerian oil stolen and sold abroad by the previous administration. The allegations surrounding former President Goodluck Jonathan's government continue as current leader Mohamedou Buhari pleads with world leaders for aid funding. And we'll be heading to Dakar, Senegal for a tour of the Pasteur Institute that's been making vaccines for 80 years. The soon-to-be inaugurated Pasteur project is set to house a yellow fever vaccine production unit. Holding their breath, the people of Gabon are waiting for the Constitutional Court to make its decision regarding last month's presidential vote. Ali Bongo was declared the winner by just 6,000 votes. And his rival, Jean Ping, contests that outcome. Ping went to court over the results of the Otogue province, Bongo's home region, demanding a recount of ballots in each polling station there. Ping has said he does not trust the Constitutional Court as its president has two children with Ali Bongo. From the capital, here's France 24 correspondent Zigo Tochaya. Just right behind me here, is the Gabonese Constitutional Court situated in the heart of the capital of Libreville. Last night, there was a heated debate at the Constitutional Court between the defense lawyers of Mr. Ping and Mr. Ali Bongo. The president of the Constitutional Court, Marie Madeleine Borontu, gave 10 minutes each to the defense lawyers to make their cases felt. After the heated debate, she concluded by saying that the ruling would take place today, but that would be done by the court registrar. There is still suspense in the whole country of Gabon because many people are confused of what this particular decision is going to, to be and how it will shape the future of the Gabonese people. But now, today, no one knows what exactly that decision is going to be. Knocking at the door, it once slammed shut. Morocco is applying to rejoin the African Union 32 years after it left, and for the exact same reason. In 1984, the kingdom took offense when the bloc recognized Western Sahara, a territory Morocco has been fighting over against the Polisario Front independence fighters. The North African country hasn't given official reason for wanting its seat back, but Raba says more than two-thirds two of AU Member states do not recognize Western Sahara as a separate country and wants the bloc to withdraw its support. Calling for calm in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the top prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, Fatou Ben Souda, released a statement saying she was watching events on the ground closely and that some acts already perpetrated could land their authors at the ICC. This Monday and Tuesday, violence rocked the capital, Kinshasa, leaving at least 32 dead, though the opposition says close to 100 were killed. Clashes erupted as the Electoral Commission failed to announce a date for an upcoming presidential election, even as President Joseph Kabila's term is nearing its end. Asking for aid, Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari appealed to the international community to help fund humanitarian assistance for those whose lives have been destroyed by Boko Haram. He was addressing the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Meanwhile, further allegations are surfacing concerning oil fraud under the previous administration. Nigeria, it's believed some 17 billion U.S. dollars worth of oil was stolen between 2011 and 2014. The matter was discussed in Parliament on Thursday. Joining us now for uh, more on this story is Rosie Collier from Abuja, the capital. Rosie, why are these allegations coming out now? Good evening, Shona. Well, 
in a word, recession. And Nigeria has uh, been in a recession for this uh, first half of uh, 2016, and Mohamedou Buhari is doing pretty much anything to uh, plug uh, current gaps and also former gaps. So uh, what is being alleged under the uh, former administration of Good Luck Jonathan is that um, international oil companies in fact colluded uh, with uh, corrupt officials to siphon off uh, oil, uh, at crude oil, and uh, sell that abroad. Um, in uh, the, It's alleged in Norway, in uh, China, and in the United States. And so uh, this comes now because uh, a report uh, was written uh, in recent weeks, uh, quite an in-depth report apparently, using uh, uh, satellite imagery and, and other technologies to um, apparently come up with proof that uh, international oil companies have in fact not been declaring the uh, crude oil that uh, they uh, um, produce here in Nigeria and then exporting it uh, apparently illegally. So, Rosie, what are the authorities going to do now to address uh, this situation? Well, earlier this week here in Nigeria, the uh, several local newspapers were reporting that, in fact, uh, a court case has, uh, is due in, in the coming days against Egypt, so that is uh, the Italian oil major, and then Total, of course, France's uh, uh, big oil company. So um, legal action is expected to be taken against these two companies first. Um, but there is also talk then of... Um, uh, also legal action being taken against uh, the American majors uh, ExxonMobil and also Chevron. So that's a, on the uh, sort of legal side of things. And then uh, in terms of the politics, there was a, a debate in Parliament yesterday, so in the National Assembly in Abuja, um, in which uh, the report was discussed at length. And um, it's clear that uh, Mohamed Buhari really has the backing, apparently, of the majority of the National Assembly in terms of taking action against these uh, oil majors in order to try to get uh, some of these uh, stolen $17 million uh, back into Nigerian coffers. But as we've seen in the past, it could well be uh, a very long process. Um, you've you know, had a dictator here in the 1990s who st stole billions of dollars and still that money isn't you know, hasn't come back fully into Nigeria. So I think whatever action uh, the Nigerian government uh, and the, the law courts hope to take, it will uh, presumably take uh, several more years before results are seen. Thank you so much. Uh, Rosie Collier there reporting from Abuja, the Nigerian capital. Thank you. French Prime Minister Emmanuel Valls was in the Senegalese capital for a 24-hour trip. The main purpose of his visit was to attend a bilateral summit with Senegalese authorities, but Vals also toured the future Diam Nia Dio urban hub that is set to include the Pasteur project, a yellow fever vaccine production unit. Dakar's Pasteur Institute has been producing vaccines for the last 80 years. Our correspondents explored the premises. It's a landmark establishment steeped in history. Situated in the center of the capital, the Pasteur Institute in Dakar has conducted bacteriological research for nearly a century. It's here at the Pasteur Institute that the first human virus was identified. It was the yellow fever virus, and it was isolated in 1927 in this very building. Dr. Sal and his team are not just experts on yellow fever. Last year, they exported their know-how to Guinea during the Ebola epidemic and to Brazil as the Zika virus was sweeping the country. The majority of the viruses we study are circulating in Africa, so we have direct access to them. We have access to patients during epidemics, which allows us to better understand them. For nearly eight decades, the Institute has specialized in the yellow fever vaccine. It's one of just four producers worldwide and the only one in Africa. Eight million doses are produced annually here for immunization on the continent. We use the same methods that big pharmaceutical companies like Sanofi do in Europe. We produce using a specific type of egg that's made in Germany. They're free from all pathogens, so we can multiply the virus. A new unit that will increase production should see the light of day in Djamnadjou, the future urban cluster, about 30 kilometers from Dakar. There are epidemics happening right now, so there's a risk of exporting the virus to Asia. It makes vaccine production extremely important. There are plans to produce 15 million doses per year, but when there are epidemics, we are able to go up to 30 million doses per year. 
The first batch is expected in 2019 and should limit the risk of repeated shortages of the vaccine. Seeking employment far from home and leaving their children behind. As Zimbabwe faces an ongoing drought due to the effects of El Nino, adults are traveling to Botswana or South Africa to find work. But often their families back home stop hearing from them and are left even more vulnerable as soaring prices make food out of reach. Lauren Berstecker reports. Decimated livestock and entire harvests destroyed. With little economic prospects and faced with the ravages of El Nino, parents in Zimbabwe have begun to move abroad in search of work. Those who can't take their children leave them in the care of their grandparents, and they don't always come back. Our son went to Botswana last year and never sent anything back home for the kids. After a while, his wife left too because there was no money. Solomon is 79 and must now rely on charity to feed his grandchildren. The situation has become increasingly common in Zimbabwe and has social services worried. As parents uh, migrate outwardly into Botswana or South Africa, they leave their children in the care of their grandparents who are also unable to fend for their children. That's giving us a serious challenge in terms of providing for the children. At just 17 years old, Vanessa is already the head of her family. She takes care of herself and her siblings while waiting for their mother. Our mom went to South Africa to look for work. She hasn't sent anything back since she left. She called twice to say she hadn't found work yet. With the drought showing no sign of slowing down and market prices rising, access to food has become a priority for many Zimbabweans. According to UNICEF, over a million children are already facing starvation. That's it from us here at Eye on Africa. For now, do stay tuned to more news coming up on France 24.